get that started. Um, again, welcome to Monday mornings. Um, this is our last Zoom of the Monday morning season. Our first in-person one will be on April 25th. Uh, the 18th is a holiday, so I hope to see you all at April 25th for our in-person program. Um, I want to thank the friends for sponsoring the Monday morning series. And with that, I'd like to welcome Jane O'Neill. She is here today to talk about earth art, landscape as canvas. Hi, Jane. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about earth art. Um, let's start off with a quick introduction. My name is Jane O'Neill. My background is in art history and in education. I have a master's degree in both fields. And I've worked at a number of art museums and cultural institutions. But about five years ago, I started Culturally Curious, which is um, an arts education consulting firm. And I began to specialize in art appreciation programs like this. And with COVID, we've gone virtual. And it's just been such a pleasure to find these great stories, these great images, and weave them all together. So that's what we will be experiencing over the next hour. And, um, and just to get us all oriented in terms of what earth art is, maybe some of you sort of remember some of these uh, major works, but essentially it's an artistic movement that's generally rooted to the 1960s and 70s. It's mostly American artists, there's some British artists, and for the most part, they're using um, sort of novel materials, novel um, art making practices, and they're moving outside of museums, of commercial galleries, of traditional art making spaces, really. So there's a lot more to it than that, but we're going to be digging deeper into it over the course of the next hour. So what I thought we would do is sort of start off with the lay of the land, how we'll spend this hour together. So um, the image here is this fantastic Andy Goldsworthy installation in a eucalyptus grove um, in, in a San Francisco park. And so we've got this sort of wonderful meandering line. So we're gonna kind of meander through this material today too. We're going to start off with two sections here that are really sort of First, the backstory, the big um, art history, history related to these works um, that sort of set the stage for things. And then with climate and conditions, we're just going to quickly review what was happening in the 1960s and 70s that created sort of the perfect launch pad for an artistic movement like this. And then we have four artists in particular who um, I think give us a, a nice sort of broad overview of this movement. We're not not doing comprehensive, but we're doing broad, and they all they all kind of approach this this movement um, in their own individual way. So we've got a good um, we've got good breadth here, and um, and then we'll wrap up, and we can. Uh, field any questions at that point along the way too. So once I get rolling, I sort of get rolling, but if you wanted to uh, type a question in the chat before you forget it, please feel free to do that. And then we'll circle back to everything at the end. So let's get started with seeds and roots, thinking about um, what are these major works that came before earth art that sort of set the stage for a movement like this? Well, I think it's just good to keep in mind some of the major earth works that, that happened um, even uh, millennia before, before the 1960s and 70s. So probably the most famous out of all of them is Stonehenge, um, and which dates to about 3000 BC. It's in Wiltshire, England. And we all probably have some recognition or understanding of this rather mysterious site with these um, incredibly large uh, stones that are about three times the size of a human. And of course, we see it now uh, in a kind of a partially destroyed state. There's uh, These were supposed to be uh, fully capped rings, concentric rings here, and various stones have fallen over time. So there's this idea that when you make a work of art outside, of course, there's going to be natural elements that impact it. There's going to be human elements that impact it. But with something like Stonehenge, this was a major 
major undertaking, um, a major coordination of labor. This was all created before the invention of the wheel. So we don't even really know how they created um, some of these works and how they, they got these massive stones on top of these blocks that are about 18 feet high. So there's, a, there's the mystery element to it. There's the sort of metaphysical element. There's this idea that it aligns with um, the celestial calendar and maybe played a role with um, agrarian culture or, or religion. So all of that kind of mystery <clears throat> gets folded in, I think you'll see, when we start looking at some of the works that are created even during our time. So our next kind of great work to keep in mind as we're thinking about um, the precedent uh, for earth art it are the great pyramids of Giza. Now, oftentimes we just so sort of uh, sweep this under the umbrella of architecture and kind of move on from there. But these really are earth art uh, works because it's it's simply cutting stone, moving stone, and stacking stone, balancing it in such a way that it has lasted since about 2500 BC. So um, there's also that sort of interesting connection to the heavens when we're looking at the Great Pyramids of Giza, because there is this one theory that the that the arrangement of these pyramids in particular might align with the um, with the stars in Orion's belt in that that constellation there. So there's all sorts of, of um, guessing, of wondering about what the bigger purpose is for something that is such an enormous undertaking. And just to give you a quick reminder of just what an impressive undertaking the, the pyramids at Giza are, look at this image. See, it, notice the, the, the figure in the foreground, and then you're looking up the side of that pyramid. You get a sense for just how large these stones are and how precisely they're cut and put into place. Um, so, so really it's that it's that marvel of how this was done. And, um, and I think there's, for several of the artists that we're looking at today, there's a sense of trying to capture that same kind of wonder that we have when we look at something as impressive as the Giza pyramids or on the same scale as the famous Nazca lines in Peru in South America. So there are, um, thousands of yards of these lines and dozens of these enormous effigies that have been created in the desert in Peru. And the way that they were created was basically there's just like a shallow channel that is that that's sort of dug up. It's only about six inches uh, deep. And then the pebbles are just moved to the side and it creates this channel. And those are the lines that are created to form the shape of, in this case, a monkey. Of course, we've also got insects, this incredible spider here. These are anywhere from 400 feet tall to over a thousand, um, uh, over a thousand yards tall, actually. So they are absolutely enormous. We have um, flowers. We've got a great little hummingbird over here. And of course, a human figure too, who seems to be uh, waving to us. And all of these things have survived since they were created somewhere around 500 uh, BC to about 500 AD. And of course, all these same questions that we've been sort of pondering since uh, Stonehenge, you know, the, the why, the how, um, in this case, these major earthworks are remarkably well preserved because there's hardly any wind in this desert. And also they're remote. There's very few people who are coming and um, creating any human impact on, on these lines. But the scale of them is awe-inspiring. These are major undertakings. And, and once again, that metaphysical quality, you know, just exactly why were they created and how were they created with this incredible precision that we see here, these remarkably straight lines. So we will um, sort of wrap up on our seeds and roots by heading back to North America and considering uh, the fact that we have these um, these incredible mound structures throughout North America. This is, I think, one of the largest over here on the left, and this is in Illinois. It's a mound that's about 100 feet tall. You can probably just see the people at the top and at the bottom here. This is a major earthwork uh, um, undertaking, and this was all created, of course, before the use or the, the advent of heavy machinery. So all this soil is being excava excavated and moved 
by hand in order to create this kind of fake mountain that probably had um, ceremonial purposes. This was definitely created at a time when um, civilization and cultures were sophisticated enough that there's this kind of hierarchy in, um, in communities. So probably the most important people or the, or, or, um, the people who are at the top of the food chain in terms of uh, the spiritual life of the people kind of got to go to the top of, of this particular mound. Over on the right is another mound that was created in Southern Ohio. And if you look carefully, it is in this kind of serpentine shape. This is actually the largest serpent effigy in all of the world. And this was created somewhere about 2000 years ago. Once again, we don't exactly know why, but we do know that, uh, that human beings excavated all of this earth and brought it to this particular space to change the landscape so that it would look like this. And I, you know, we always guess that it had ceremonial purposes. So, so we even have a history in America of this happening. Uh, so we'll just round out this section, go full circle here. We've got our Stonehenge at the top and just across the highway, we've got this wonderful crop circle. So we even have earthworks that are happening today or at least in recent memory. Um, uh, sort of connecting back to that awe-inspiring element, that mysterious element that so many of these other major undertakings from um, hundreds, if not thousands of years ago seem to still possess. So let's turn our attention to the 1960s and the 1970s and just uh, remember what was happening there in terms of the environmental movement. Uh, what was the political climate like that might have led to... Um, an undertaking like the earth art movement. Okay, so here is just a quick reminder that in the early 1960s, especially, you have artists like Andy Warhol over here on the left and Klaus Oldenburg who are fully engaged in pop art. And pop art is all about consumerism, right? I mean, Andy Warhol was making works of art that could easily pass as commercials. They look exactly like advertisements. And here, Klaus Oldenburg with his soft sculptures, I think he's sort of tapping into the fast food culture of America here too. So it's all about consuming and, you know, um, it, uh, sort of hand in hand with that, the, this notion of waste too. Um, it's about uh, more, more, more. And of course, this is something that a lot of earth artists are going to be reacting against. Uh, another art movement that's happening in the 1960s is called minimalism. And minimalism is really, in so many ways, the opposite of pop art. It's about, it's not about consuming anything. It's about paring art down to its most basic, most essential elements and appreciating it for what it is. So this is a work by an American artist named Carl Andre. It was created in 1966 and it's called Equivalent Eight. And what you're looking at is literally just a pile of bricks. <laughs> but with, with, um, with minimalist art, the artists are asking us to consider um, what these bricks look like. What's the texture of the bricks? What's the color of the bricks? Engage with that material on a fundamental uh, level, and then consider the way that the artist has arranged it. How does it impact the space that you're in? How can you move around it? How can you understand it in different ways? Incidentally, um, the Tate uh, Gallery in, in, um, in London purchased this work for the equivalent of about $6,000 um, back in the 1960s. And it was called the most boring controversy in the history of art because they used taxpayer money to uh, buy a pile of bricks for $6,000. Anyways, so um, I think people, a lot of people still struggle to understand or appreciate minimalism, but this had a huge impact on what a lot of uh, earth artists engage with. So let's turn our attention to mainstream culture, what's happening in the world in, um, in the 1960s. Well, in 1962, you have Rachel Carson's book called Silent Spring, which brought to the attention of the masses really um, a, a lot of, uh, it. well, it sort of sounded the alarm bells around issues of pollution, and in particular with her book, the use of synthetic pesticides and, that's, and that impact and its impact on the, on the landscape. Now, coupled with that, this sort of rising awareness of the impact of solution of, of pollution of dwindling energy resources you have this incredible photograph that's taken 
1968 by the um by the astronaut Bill Anders and it's called Earthrise and with this view of the world all of a sudden, I think it really changed for a lot of people how they regarded the, the planet itself. It seems so small. It seems so fragile. It is this little marble floating through space and there's only one. So I think this helped to reframe the way we think of resources and pollution on the planet. So by 1970, you have the advent of the US Environmental Protection Agency and you have Earth Day. So we have um, Richard Nixon and Pat Nixon planning planting a tree on the grounds of the White House uh, by 1970. You also have uh, demonstrations around the country sort of celebrating and once again sounding the alarm around environmental issues for Earth Day. And then of course, everybody remembers the famous ad from 1971 um, from Keep America Beautiful where there's the Native American figure, actually the actor was not Native American at all, walking through the landscape, noticing all of the pollution and then turning to the camera with that one consequential tear uh, representing just how devastating uh, 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 polluting the landscape can really be. So we'll wrap up this section in terms of the political and artistic climate of the 1960s and 70s by just showing you sort of what was changing and, and what it looked like. Um, by this time, you have artists who are working in New York City who are sort of investigating the landscape in a new way. And when they have uh, exhibitions and galleries, they're literally bringing in dirt and putting dirt and soil on display. In this case, in front of a row of mirrors. So it sort of amplifies the impact of that dirt there. But I mean, this is the stuff we wipe off our shoes when we walk into our house. It's also the stuff that we grow our food in. So, um, so they're asking us to contemplate uh, the 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 very nature of dirt in, in, in new ways. But of course, you can imagine there were a lot of people who were just thinking, really? Dirt? This is what things have come to? The artist here is um, Robert Smithson. And this is a good segue to, um, to his work here, which I, I feel like I have to emphasize is a world away from Andy Warhol, pop art, consumerism, a culture of celebrity. This is like literally getting back to nature. So let's turn our attention to Robert Smithson. We see him here in two photographs from probably around the time he was in his early 30s. Robert Smithson is the artist who coined the term land art and he gave birth to the movement it itself. He was really the forerunner in all of this. He grew up in New Jersey he went to art school and then he just uh, lived immediately in New York City and he was sort of surrounding himself with all of these minimalist artists. They were having a big impact on him, including artists like Carl Andre, who made the pile of bricks. So, um, so Robert Smithson is getting all of this kind of cultural information and synthesizing it in really interesting ways. Uh, all of these relationships that he has um, completely transform the way he's making art. And incidentally, one of the artists that he starts hanging out with uh, is named Nancy Holt, and they get married. We'll be meeting Nancy Holt in just a moment. So um, Robert Smithson is really the philosopher. He's like the, the, um, the artist who's always writing about sort of the theoretical underpinnings for a movement like this. I love these two images because we see him over here on the right sitting in front of a gallery installation, which is literally just a pile of rocks behind him. And then over here on the left where he's, you know, piling those rocks into the back of his station wagon. And I can only imagine the person who snapped this photograph of him watching him pick up these rocks and think like, this is going to make a great show. The person who snapped the picture was probably either like, this guy's a genius or he's totally crazy. So he would exhibit these rocks and on the walls, he would have um, aerial views of the sites where they were excavated from or maps or, or that sort of thing, sort of connecting it to a specific location. He called these installations non-sites. So literally he's separating um, the this organic matter from, from where he found it. And apparently he was inspired to do projects like this by going home to New Jersey and literally just watching heavy machinery like excavated 
excavators kind of churn the earth and like, you know, un, uh, reveal things that were buried, like big boulders. And he thought of them as like the monuments of classical antiquity. So he's writing about all this stuff. In 1968, he actually wrote a provisional theory on non-sites, this kind of work. And just to give you a sense in terms of the way his brain is working, I'm just, I've got like two sentences here. He said, this little theory is tentative and could be abandoned at any time. Theories like things are also abandoned. That theories are eternal is doubtful. Vanished theories compose the strata of many forgotten books. <laughs> so he's really thinking about, uh, about like layers of sediment and about waste and pollution, and it's all kind of informing everything. Now, the other thing he's very interested in is the concept of entropy. This is um, the second law of, of, of thermodynamics, and that uh, predicts there's going to be an inevitable depletion and collapse of any system. Now, he became fascinated by entropy, sort of looking at history, um, the end of World War II, this idea that history and time is like a constant march forward, that there's always going to be progress. Instead, Smithson is looking at the landscape. And he says, no, it's not going to be progress. It's going to be chaos. Look at the way the natural world takes things over. There's order, there's disorder, and then there's chaos. And that's what he thought was happening with everything, which leads us to what we're looking at here on the screen, which is literally just called dead tree. This is a restaging of the original dead tree, um, which was first staged in 1969. He's got very specific specifications about the tree that has to be dead in order to um, uh, install it. But it's installed with mirrors all around it. And it's this idea that you as the viewer going into a gallery space would really be engaged with looking at like the leaves shriveling up, um, the roots drying up, everything. It, it's like watching um, the destruction of this tree before your very eyes. It's that reminder that everything sort of ends, everything is, is moving towards disorder and chaos here. Okay, so with this, <laughs> Robert Smithson decides to go outside for a while, and he visits sites like this Neolithic tomb in Great Britain and um, uh, this incredible uh, 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 rock formation in, in um, I'm sorry, in, in um, the Arches National Park over here. And of course, he's still thinking about, you know, these, these man-made objects, these naturally made objects, and, and how they might be destroyed by nature. So this leads us all to his best known work, which is called Spiral Jetty. It's a major, major undertaking for any artist. It's, um, it's literally altering the landscape. And in this case, it's the landscape of the Great Salt Lake in Utah. He did this in 1970, and he called this, as opposed to being a non-site, this he called an earthwork, which was a term he borrowed from a dystopian novel just to get us into his frame of mind again. So this is a work that is at once sort of in harmony and in disunion with the natural landscape. It's a straight line jetty that curves sort of counterclockwise in the, into this coil. Oil and um, and exists there um, still to this day in the Great Salt Lake. Now, how did they make it? They used heavy machinery. This is um, such a major undertaking that it required excavators and that sort of thing. It's the jetty itself is about 15 feet wide and it extends for about 1,500 feet. So um, he, I guess, he had to do a lot of persuading for the man who owned the heavy equipment, who just sort of thought like, what's what's the purpose? of this. This seems like a joke. Uh, years later, he said, the most important thing um, I ever did had absolutely no purpose. <laughs> but there is a 30-minute video of Robert Smithson um, putting together the, the spiral jetty. So if you see pictures of it today, you might notice that a lot of the images um, feature this sort of pinkish colored water. And that is because if you're familiar with the Great Salt Lake, it is a terminal basin, which means it doesn't have any outlets. The water all flows in. And the only way for water to leave is for it to evaporate, which leaves all the, the salt and minerals behind, which means it's very dense with salt and minerals. It's almost like the Dead Sea. Nothing can really live in it except for these microorganisms that, um, that turn the water a little bit pink on occasion. 
For Robert Smithson, he thought that this was great. For him, the pigmentation evoked the primordial seas. He talked about, you know, those water being streaked with um, bleeding scarlet streaks in this case. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this form that he's decided to use in the Great Salt Lake, the spiral form. Well, we've already seen it a few times with these ancient predecessors to, um, to Earth art with the Nazca lines, with the map mounds in, um, well, this particular mound in Southern Ohio. And of course, uh, a spiral is a really powerful form in terms of nature. We've got it in our, we've got it on our bodies. Uh, we can find it in, in plants and in shells and in the very shape of the galaxy. There's also these wonderful connections to math, um, the Fibonacci sequence, this idea of adding two numbers and then, um, and then you create a new sum, you add it with the, the, with the previous number, and then that number keeps expanding in this predictable way. And you can see that that creates a spiral form if you were to graph out those numbers um, on, on a two-dimensional surface like this. The Fibonacci sequence is also related to something called the golden ratio, which is also about spirals. The golden ratio has informed artists for centuries, actually millennia, really. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci is really famous for using the golden ratio, which essentially uh, takes a, 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 a rectangle that has a particular proportions. And when you divide it into, when you subdivide that rectangle into a perfect square, and another rectangle, the secondary rectangle has the same aspect ratio of the original rectangle. So you can see Leonardo da Vinci's famous Mona Lisa from the 1500s is, um, is <laughs> filled essentially with the golden ratio and the entire picture itself is a golden ratio. This being, um, the, well, you can divide it either way. There's a square this way and a square going this way. But even on the Mona Lisa's face, you can find this golden ratio again and again and again. And you can see once you start dividing it up with more and more rectangles, you get another spiral form, like the one that we see in the spiral jetty. So a lot of really incredible connections to math, to science, to art, to nature. So my question for you is, what do we do with it? What is the purpose of the spiral jetty? And I should mention, we're going much deeper into this particular work than any of the others that we'll look at today, because it's it's the first and it's the most significant. So if you were to go and visit it, it's about two hours from any major airport. It's like a pilgrimage to get there. And what would you do? Would you just look at it from the coast? Maybe you would walk out on it and and just walk in a circle, get to the end and walk all the way back. Um, I mean, really, what is the purpose? And when I ask myself that question, I'm reminded of, um, of labyrinth uh, like mazes. So th this labyrinth, or really it's a meander, is a very sort of uh, similar experience. And you saw a lot of these patterns, these designs in Gothic churches on the floor. So that pilgrims, people who traveled great distances to get to that destination, could sort of reflect on it, mind, body, and soul by just walking this labyrinth. It's not a maze, it's nothing for them to figure out. It's just a path that you walk. Now, Harvard medical researchers have done research studies on people who walk labyrinth mazes like this, and they find that it lowers your heart rate, it decreases your blood pressure, um, it actually even helps with chronic pain. So there's all these, um, these really incredible benefits to walking a labyrinth like this. Maybe Smithson was thinking that just walking on this spiral jetty could kind of transform you mind, body, and soul in a perfect, in a similar way too. So we'll wrap up on the spiral jetty by just thinking about this notion of entropy, revisiting entropy, because for Robert Smithson, the idea is nature is never finished. You can create a work like this, but then nature is going to always change it. And almost immediately after he created the spiral jetty, it was submerged by the waters of the Great Salt Lake for nearly two decades. People kind of forgot it was there almost. But these days, the, 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 the waters are receding dramatically. So as you can see in this photograph, the shoreline has changed. The spiral jetty isn't even underwater presently. So, um, so it will be impacted by wind and by other things, but it will slowly change over time, probably not the way Robert 
Smithson uh, imagined. But we'll wrap up with Robert Smithson with, um, with his, this last work of his, which is called Amarillo Ramp. And this was created for a water basin where you can see it's literally just a massive ramp that um, is created by this excavated soil. And I imagine the top of the ramp probably would have just touched the, the surface of the water of this um, of this man-made basin, which we can also see has dried up. Now, tragically, Robert Smithson died while he was in an airplane flying over this site, just surveying the site the airplane crashed. So his wife and several other artists finished the work for him and, um, and then, you know, did their best to kind of uh, try and cement his, um, his artistic contributions, his reputation going forward. So let's turn our attention to his wife and fellow artist, Nancy Holt. Nancy Holt is sort of a local girl. She's from uh, Worcester, Massachusetts originally, but she went to high school in New Jersey. And that's where she met Robert Smithson. They were classmates in high school, but then sort of lost track of each other. She went to Tufts and I believe she ma majored in biology. And after college, she moved to New York City. She reconnects with Robert Smithson. They get married three years later in 1963 and they're living in the West Village and they are running in these avant-garde artistic circles with the likes of, of major minimalist artists. So Nancy Holt starts off her, um, her artistic career behind the camera. She is the person that shoots the video of the, um, of the creation of the spiral jetty. She's also really interested in recording audio, but she is sort of behind the scenes for the most part. And she's somebody who's really interested in kind of framing the view, framing the story. And I think that's a perfect segue to one of her best known early works, which is called Sun Tunnels. This is in the Great uh, Basin Desert in Utah, and they date to, well, she started it the year her husband died in 1973, and she finished, finished it three years later. So what we're looking at seems pretty straightforward, right? We're looking at three major tunnels here. You can see that they are um, way over um, human sized here, but they are created to frame our view, not in the way that a picture in a museum does with a rectangle, but in the way a telescopic lens does. And that's what these sun tunnels do. They function sort of similar to Stonehenge. It's this idea of bringing um, the heavens down to earth and framing up that view. So we'll take a look at how that works in just a moment. Let's turn our attention to how these works are created. These are just, I mean, they're massive tunnels. They weigh 22 tons. And, um, and th th in terms of diameter, they're about nine and a half feet tall. This is Nancy Holt sort of directly directing the whole um, installation of these works. And she purchased the, this specific land um, just to create this, this, uh, this, well, what you see is, I think, a pretty remarkable work. So it's a loose arrangement in this kind of X formation. And they are arranged according uh, sort to sort of function like a celestial calendar. So it lines up with the equinox. And, um, and so uh, while the sun is rising and setting, you get this beautiful alignment through multiple tunnels. And it lasts 10 days before the equinox and 10 days afterwards. So it seems, again, sort of otherworldly, sort of metaphysical. Beyond that, she even bored these holes into these huge tunnels. And these holes and the size of them uh, uh, correspond to the stars in a, uh, like four different constellations. And of course, the light of those uh, coming through those holes into the tunnels changes and moves throughout the day. So you almost feel like you're in a, like a little planetarium. And inside the tunnels, because they're so massive, the temperature is like 20 degrees cooler than inside than outside. Uh, so I, I can't help but want to like sit in one of these tunnels and just watch the sunlight play uh, for an entire day, even I guess through the night, the moonlight shines through too. It's absolutely gorgeous. So in the end, she's created this, this celestial calendar that adds this very simple but very elegant poetry to this landscape here. And I think what's really important to understand about Nancy Holt and her different approach to, to making earthwork, uh, earthworks or land art that really differ, differs from her husband is that she created things that she really intended people to use because she is framing up views that's um, so important to her. So this is called the Stone Enclosure Rock Rings from 1978. 
state, and this is on the campus of uh, Western Washington University. So, I mean, it's there for people to engage with. She worked with stonemasons and with astronomers. And in this case, the portals and the windows here are supposed to draw your eye to the North Star. And as we get down to the land here, you can see that even though it's just two um, concentric rings, the, the, the series of doorways here looks much more um, expansive, extensive uh, than you might initially imagine. And then once again, these circular windows are sort of functioning as that telescopic view that I mentioned before with the sun tunnels. Now, um, Nancy Holt was sort of a forerunner in public sculpture and integrating it into public places. I feel like we have so much to thank her for because of that, because uh, she, she worked on one particular project called Dark Star Park. And you can see the, the, the before picture over here, which was um, the, this public space that had sort of gone to ruin. And then the after is this beautiful park that's uh, kind of manicured. It's got this art installation and it's being used and enjoyed by people. So what is the Dark Star Park? You, you might guess that it has something to do with these massive concrete um, spheres here. She uses them, she sort of dots the landscape with them, and you can see some of them have holes bored through them to once again kind of frame up our view. They're integrated, they're perfectly integrated into this landscape, uh, uh, connected to these little round reflecting pools to the round tunnel over here. And when we look at the aerial view, there are those reflecting pools again. And then just across the street, there's two more spheres. And you'll notice there's these tall beams that go just behind them. This is Nancy Holt once the project was completed. She's standing in front of those tall beams over here. And you'll notice on the ground what looks like almost like a, a, a shadow pattern from the beams and from the spheres just behind her. That shadow pattern is integrated into the park and once a year, the shadows uh, on the ground actually line up with the shadows being cast by the sun. And it lines up on a specific date that's um, important to this region. This is Alexandria, Virginia, and, and it aligns up with the date, August 1st, um, a specific time, 923 in the morning, when this land was purchased by William Henry Ross in 1860. So even though the purchase of the land might not mean that much to most people, look at the crowds that come out to see that beautiful alignment that happens. It does, it seems like a celebration. Um, it, these are people using and enjoying this space in a way that never would have happened without Nancy, Nancy Holt's uh, art installation here. So we'll wrap up on Nancy Holt. I love this picture of her and Robert Smithson from around the time they met in the 60s. Um, and thinking about the fact that after her husband died at age 35, she never remarries. She spends the next 40 years on her own making works of art, advocating for public art and public sculptures, um, and, and then uh, you know helping to preserve her husband's legacy too. She died in 2014 at the age of 75 and her will decreed the creation of the Holt Smithson Foundation, which has an incredible website. If you like their work, I highly recommend going to their website. There's so much good information, awesome pictures. Uh, but interestingly, also according to her will, the, the foundation will be dissolved in um, 2038, which would be their 100th birthdays. So um, sort of like nature taking over or causing the ruin of something, there's a little bit of entropy involved in their will as well. All right, so we're going to turn our attention to our next artist here. This is Anna Mendieta, our third artist of the day. And she she is very different from the artists that we've looked at so far. Anna Mendieta was not running in the same circles in New York City. She's about a decade younger than the two artists that we've looked at so far. She and she was born in Cuba. She um, when she was a, uh, a oh, and I should say too that. Um, that she was still in college when Robert Smithson created the spiral jetty. But like Robert Smithson, we're going to see that Anna Mendieta has a premature and very tragic death. So like I said, she was born in Cuba and she spent her, her, entire, her entire childhood there. This is her in the foreground, her parents and her siblings. Now, um, when she was just on the cusp of becoming a teen, there was 
a program called Operation Peter Pan, which got I, I, like over 10,000 children out of Cuba sort of as political refugees. And so she and her older sister were sent to Iowa and they were separated from their family for five years. They stayed together, but they were completely separated from their family. They lived in foster homes and orphanages. They went to reform school. I imagine this was a very difficult time for these young for these young ladies, but eventually they were reunited with their family. And it was during these, um, these difficult years as a teen that Anna Mendieta discovers her connection to art, her love of art. So she ends up staying in Iowa for college. She goes, she gets a BA and an MA in painting and then stays on for an MFA, um, focusing on a variety of different artistic practices, including video, um, sculpture and painting. She kind of becomes a little bit of a performance artist too. So in the end, she will, eventually go to New York City and start interacting with a lot of these artists that we've looked at so far. But she does some really important things in Iowa sort of on her own that I think are worth looking at. So in 1972, when she's still um, a student, she does this uh, untitled work, which is documented through photographs. It's like, like a lot of earth art, it's ephemeral. It's not really built to last. And all she's doing here is she has a fellow student who is clipping his uh, facial hair and clipping his hair, and she's affixing it to her, to her face. She's transforming forming herself. Uh, I mean, this gets into like gender fluidity and all this other stuff, but she is, I think she's really interested in the fact that this is organic material. It's dead, but it's growing, but it can also be sort of easily severed and, and kind of moved around. Um, she's doing really groundbreaking work because I mean, what she's doing here, I mean, she's kind of prompting conversations about gender that, um, that we're only as a culture just beginning to have now or getting more comfortable having now. She also created uh, this video that same year in 1972, where um, <laughs> this is very provocative. She's outside, obviously she's in front of this, um, this stream she's naked and she pours chicken blood all over herself and then rolls around in chicken feathers and kind of stands up in the last moments of the film with her arms spread out like a bird so there's references to religion here there's the connection to the earth in this organic material she's always been very um very uh, moved by uh, 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 the issue of violence against women. And she oftentimes uses chicken blood to describe that or to refer to that. And that seems to, in some ways, be a precursor to her very tragic early death, which we'll be getting to momentarily. Then she gets into things that are, I think, more traditionally considered landscape art. So we've got an Anna, Anna Mendieta uh, work over here on the right contrasted with Robert Smithson's uh, earthwork, his famous spiral jetty over on the left. Now, Anna Mendieta refers to her works as body works as opposed to earthworks. And, um, and we can see that it originates with her body. It's on a much more human scale. It's much more personal. Um, all of her work is really about her life and her experiences. So she creates, a, a, well, she does this whole series called the Silhouetta series. Oftentimes, it's just the outline of her body. In this case, she's lying in a tomb in Mexico. And, the, and for the photograph, they put all these um, flowers as though they're kind of sprouting from her body. So sort of like that, um, that experiment that she was doing with human hair. This is a work that's about death, something being dead, but also being sort of the, the source of life springing forth um, again as well. So here are a few more images from her Silhouetta series, a brief statement that she made about these works. She said, I've been carrying out a dialogue between the landscape and the female body based on my own silhouette. I believe that this has been a direct result of my having been torn from my homeland Cuba during my adolescence. I'm overwhelmed by the feeling of having been cast Cast from the womb or nature. My art is the way I reestablish the bonds that unite me to the universe. It is the return to the maternal source. So once again, we see the outline of her form in different locations that are um, sort of personally important to her in Mexico and Cuba and in Iowa. And she engages, or she sort of, um, 
she enlivens that that outline in really interesting ways. Sometimes it's frozen, sometimes it's on fire, and sometimes it's filled with um, with red paint that looks like blood. Uh, just a few more of these works here. She talked about they, these works having been um, a way for her to kind of be rerouted, reconnected to the landscape after feeling this incredible disconnect that she grew up with. I love this one over here. It's so mysterious. And then over here, we see um, her body sort of lying in that silhouette. Once again, there's the use of chicken blood there, um, uh, foreshadowing what's to come because Anna Mendieta marries um, the minimalist artist, Carl Andre, that same artist that we saw who created the pile of bricks early on. Now he's about 13 years older than her. He's very well established in the art world and they have sort of a tumultuous relationship. They dated for several years and then they got married in, um, in 1985. They were known to sort of fight a lot, to drink a lot, and it doesn't end well for Anna Mendieta because just eight months after they were married, you can see from the headline here, sculptor accused of pushing wife out window to death. They lived on the 34th floor of, um, of a building in New York City. And after a fight one night, um, she did fall from the window. Uh, according, well, the for the 911 call, Carl Andre said, my wife is an artist and I'm an artist. And we had a quarrel about the fact that I was more uh, exposed to the public than she was. And she went into the bedroom and I went after her and she went out the window. Scan is that people heard them fighting. He had scratches on her his nose. So uh, a lot of people assumed that he probably pushed her. Um, he was actually tried for her murder, but acquitted uh, based on... Um, uh, lack of evidence. So uh, he's still alive today. He's 86 years old. And, um, and he's still this very well, um, well respected artist for his contributions to minimalism. But when institutions uh, launch uh, exhibitions of Carl Andre's work, people show up now in the name of Anna Mendieta, because people are really just starting to understand and appreciate her contributions. So, um, so they even go so far as to throw chicken blood on the sidewalk in front of galleries that are exhibiting his work. I think Anna Mendieta would be proud. And even the Guerrilla Girls, who are a, an anonymous collective uh, of, of artists and art historians who call themselves the conscience of the art world, they've even gone so far as to compare Carl Andre to, um, to O.J. Simpson. So, um, so his reputation is certainly in decline, whereas uh, even now today, I think Anna Mendieta, there's more, way more interest in, in her body of work. So we'll wrap up with um, Andy Goldsworthy, who I think is a favorite for so many people. Now he's a British artist. He's got the OBE at the end of his name. That means the Order of the British Empire. In the year 2000, he was made an officer um, for his contributions to the arts. Um, in terms of our timetable, he is about the same age as Anna Mendieta. And um, and, and unlike Anna Mendieta, he was able to continue making work throughout his entire life. So at the age of 65, he's got this incredible body of work that, uh, that uh, shows his engagement with the landscape. Now, we had Smithson who died. We had Men Mendieta who died. Um, they were both real visionaries. I think it's very interesting to think like how this, this movement could have been further fleshed out with um, with these forerunners um, if, if they had lived. But of, of course, Nancy Holt made this incredible contribution in terms of public parks and sculptures. Andy Goldworthy's work is much more intimate. It's not really made for people to go and experience a lot of the times. These are like his little experiments in, in, in the forest. So he's a Brit, but he now lives in Scotland. When he went to art school, he had a very small studio space. And so one day he went outside because he was feeling a little claustrophobic Phobic. And he was doing work with like rocks and the water. And he said that within the space of a few hours, he learned more about materials and the tides than anything else he had learned all semester long. He went back and he told his professor about it. His professor told him about Robert Smithson. And basically from that point on, Andy Goldsworthy thought, well, I'm not going back inside. <laughs> so let's take a quick look in terms of how it all relates. We're doing sort of a forced comparison here between Smithson's Spiral Jetty and a spiral work by Andy Goldsworthy. Goldsworthy's work, of course, is a much more intimate 
it is much more intimate in terms of scale. We have these very smooth beach stones and you can see that he has broken each and every one of them. I've never broken a rock before, I don't think in my entire life. So I can imagine that this was a tricky element in terms of producing this work. And then he's also scratched off some of the surface pigment here too, to create this beautiful arrangement. Now, spirals don't factor into Andy Goldsworthy's work that often, but he says uh, in cases where he feels like the context sort of works, and here's the context, um, it, it, it might le lend itself to a spiral formation. But unlike Robert Smithson, he's not going to impose a spiral jetty on the landscape if, if he feels like it doesn't work there. Now, one of his early student works, I think, tells us a lot about Andy Goldsworthy and his practice. He was simply out at the beach kind of playing with rocks. <laughs> and he goes from this chaotic pile of stones and he creates this kind of wonderful, almost perfect line leading out to the water. And that's really it. You know, the, these rocks would sink into the sand, they'd get washed away by the water. Uh, but it's this photo documentation of, of, the, of the design here and then kind of letting it go to nature is really what Andy Goldsworthy is all about. From there in the 1970s, he gets really interested in rock stacking rock balancing he's considered the the like the father of the modern rock stacking movement so um so we can see these very tricky comp compositions that he's done um he claims that he's also really interested in like um, in this kind of magical mystical moment where everything comes together, but then also in, in how things go to ruin, um, that notion of entropy that, that Smithson had talked about. But for Andy Goldsworthy, really the photographs are the successes, not really the, um, the aftermath. So, um, so we get to appreciate these incredible uh, moments. And a few years later, he's still doing some rock stacking, but it's on a much smaller scale and it's gotten even trickier. Now I have a three-year-old son and there so many rocks lying around my house all the time. I was sitting at the dining room table the other day. I couldn't even get three to stand on top of each other. So you can imagine just how motivated and dedicated Andy Goldsworthy is to making these um, compositions. He apparently grew up on a farm and he talked a lot about um, the, the rhythmic and repetitious, uh, uh, the, the um, work that you have to do as, uh, you know, a farmhand, you know, digging up potatoes, that sort of thing. And he finds that same rhythm in creating his works. Uh, he also uses sticks in his works. I love this composition. It reminds me of the ripples in a pond or the planet Saturn. There's these wonderful references. He said, just finding the right sticks took much longer than creating the composition here. He snaps the picture and then the whole thing goes away. It's not like he leads groups out to look at a composition like this. It's something he creates. The picture holds on to it for the rest of us, and then it goes back to nature. Um, a few more stick compositions that he created, these wonderful serpentine lines with sycamore sticks. Uh, his journal documents that he was doing this in the pouring rain, and after a while he got pretty irritated with the whole process. Um, uh, and then in more recent years, he's been doing like these constructions, in this case, a little bridge with alder branches that doesn't actually span the stream, but goes into the stream. This really remarkable um, uh, pointed arch kind of gothic uh, passageway through the forest here. Once again, you can only imagine how often these things collapse before they get to these, this really perfect um, uh, uh, moment for the photograph. Goldsworthy also injects himself into some of his works. Um, and he's almost got this little streak of, a, of being a performance artist. This is, um, the, this is a photograph of him kind of walking across these hedgerows, but he looks like he is a stick man here, right? Um, it's called Hedge Crawl. And in, his, um, in the notes for this photograph, he wrote, um, Dawn, Frost cold hands. <laughs> he is not afraid to get uncomfortable. He's been doing these things called rain shadows for, uh, I think, decades. Uh, essentially, when he feels the rain coming on, he lays down and, or lies down and just uh, uh, lets the water soak the landscape. He really uh, gets very familiar with like the quality of the raindrops and that sort of thing. And then he stands up so that you can see his silhouette here. I think it's worth contrasting this to Anna Mendieta's work and her sort of tight silhouettes here, in the, you know, uh, versus 
the man who is doing maybe a little bit of man spreading here with arms and legs wide out like this. In recent years, he's even done some rain shadows in New York City. I'm um, just lying down on the sidewalk. People like jump over him and then he stands up and there's his silhouette there on the ground. Um, he's very focused on, on the ground, what he finds on the ground in the woods. He uses the colors of leaves to organize so many just startling, remarkable compositions. He loves um, a, a good circle with kind of this void at the center of it. That's a, a form that he goes back to many times as is a sort of serpentine line, like what we see here. This is so great how he starts off with the green leaves and. Uh, and the yellow stripe and then he sort of switches it halfway to the green stripe with the with the yellow leaves uh, in more recent years some of those compositions with the leaves have, have just become eye-popping in particular uh the sycamore tree over here in the center um i have a seven-year-old son who just went gaga over this he's like it looks like it's lava it's it's just really impressive these are just um leaves from an elm tree that he has made almost into like police tape on the edge of this little waterfall here and then sometimes he just uses his own spit to um to wrap the leaves uh, around something, in this case, a stick. It almost looks like he's created a little sweater for it. Andy Goldsworthy also works in snow and in ice and creates these fantastic compositions. Some of them look deceptively easy, like this stack of snowballs that almost looks like a, a, a beautiful necklace. The ice, the ice sculptures are just remarkable. And there are great videos of, um, of Andy Goldsworthy at work in particular, and you can easily find some of them on YouTube. You can watch him making this sculpture where it looks like the ice is sort of looping in and out and through this ro this rock here and of course he's taking icicles and breaking them down so that he can reform them in this shape here and of course where he's living it never gets very cold for very long so he's always kind of frantically working against the clock so you get just a little bit of snow and you can make a wonderful serpent form like this one this ice sculpture is is especially remarkable i think it's uh from 20 uh, 10. Once again, this is just something that he makes out in the wilderness by himself. It, it collapsed two days later and shattered into a thousand pieces, but the photograph shows us um, what he was up to. Sometimes he even goes to remote locations where no one could really follow him. Here he's on the, uh, the very tip of the planet. He's at the North Pole. And he had um, educated himself in indigenous um, uh, uh, snow packing and snow carving. So he uses those that those uh, methods in order to create these four rings, these four arches. Let me just tell you, trying to build an arch in general is very difficult <laughs> and to do it here uh, four times over is, is quite an undertaking. And in this case, all four of these rings lead south because you're on the uh, on the North Pole and they kind of frame up the view in a nice way, sort of similar to Nancy Holtz. So we'll wrap up with Andy Goldsworthy um, with a more permanent work that he created back in stone. This is in, uh, in New York State at uh, an outdoor sculpture park called Storm King, which is definitely worth visiting. Visiting. And um, and this is called Storm King Wall. It's from 1998. And it was his first museum commission for permanent work in the United States. At the time, it was his largest work as well. And so this is, um, in some places, a five foot tall wall that meanders on for about 2000 feet. And it's made of nearly 15, uh, 1500 tons of stone. He did not build it himself. He had a team. Uh, but there's, uh, there's some thinking behind this, which I find really interesting. And I'm just going to actually skip forward here to this slide here. You can see how we've got that serpentine line that he loves so much. And so he's going sort of in and around different trees here. Uh, you almost get the sense that the trees are neighbors talking over the fence. He started um, uh, the, the basis for this work was kind of a ruined uh, field stone wall that already existed on the property. And I think maybe he, he internalized a little bit of Robert Frost and mending fences, but, um, but sort of the pointlessness of these fences when you're not actually trying to keep animals away from each other, livestock separate. So in this case, he's sort of suggesting that, that um, 
that maybe the, the trees need to be separated in particular. I've also read some interesting interpretation that he kind of imagines maybe Americans sort of like to take sides on different issues. <laughs> that, that's sort of part of our, our nature, which seems particularly true. So, so you get this wonderful interaction between the wall and, and the trees here, but notice too how in the photo on the left, the wall goes right into the water. And, um, and so here it is going into the water and it comes up out of the water on the other side and turns into a straight wall over here, which I think is kind of wonderful, very playful. So we'll wrap up, uh, we're right at 1030. And so I've got just like a one minute long conclusion for you, just sort of reflecting on what we've seen and how it all kind of works together. We saw Robert Smithson, who's our philosopher for the day. He's the person that introduced our key landscape or our key ideas, and he makes them valid with this massive undertaking that's, uh, you know, an earthwork on a grand scale. We met uh, Nancy Holt, who uh, brings the heavens down to earth with her installations, and she creates things that are not ephemeral, that are not supposed to be taken over by nature. They're built to last, and they are built as community gathering spaces, community building spaces, really, too. This is uh, people coming together to enjoy the solstice at the sun tunnels here. And then we saw Anna Mendieta, who, whose work is very personal. It's about her experiences. It's about her body, her emotional pain. Um, they're raw. They're powerful. They're about uh, her vulnerability. And they seem to sometimes foretell her very tragic and untimely death. And then we finished up with Andy Goldsworthy, who is really our craftsman. He was the person who created these incredible ephemeral constructions, these engagements with the landscape, um, producing something that nature itself could never make on its own. So we'll end with a quote from Andy Goldsworthy. He said, we often forget that we are nature. Nature is not something separate from us. So when we say we have lost our connection to nature, we've lost our connection to ourselves. So hopefully over the next few weeks, while we're out cleaning up our yards and getting our gardens going and we get our hands back in the soil, we'll feel that connection back to nature and ourselves um, on an individual basis. So I will end there for now and I welcome any questions or comments anybody has about the artists we looked at. I'll start looking at the chat here too.